I'm a, I might see. You know, so working with people that really constantly just redefine success, people that are not scared to just take chances, they're, they're heroes to me, and they're, they're, they're motivation for me. And even, uh, even though, you know, I'm, I'm older than some of, uh, not too much older, but I'm older than some, thank you. But uh, I'm older than some of these young people. Uh, they still motivate me. They still motivate me because they're keeping that idea alive, you know. And uh, when I met this next presenter, you know, just how accomplished this person, like, her presence is. I was like, man, like, you know, I want to kind of do what you're doing, you know. So, so, ladies and gentlemen, Sloan Gustafson. Thank you so much for that very gracious introduction. My name is Sloan Adroge Gustafson, and I'm a senior at St. John's School, and my presentation is called Perceptions of Perfection in Fashion Design and Culture. So my mom came to the United States from Buenos Aires, Argentina, when she was only 10 years old, with 14 suitcases, her four siblings, two parents, and the American dream. Her dad was a medical researcher on a grant, making about $22,000 a year in Boston, raising five kids along with his wife, my grandmother. Long story short, the Adroga tradition really continued abroad as they studied hard, had the good fortune to be able to go to college, graduate school, and then be able to all become doctors or lawyers. This was the same trajectory expected of me. All in all, my family has about as many global representatives as the Olympics, toting flags of Sweden, Argentina, Mexico, Lebanon, Russia, and as we all sit around the family table, often my grandfather will cheer, America's great, his thick accent still very intact, and the rest of the family cheers in return. This global exposure also has really shown me all the different perspectives, different religions, different cultures, different languages, and has forced me to really appreciate the richness of diversity, as well as look at all the social and political issues around the world, and especially look at those here at home. Another huge influence was my mother who every day when I was in pre-kindergarten, before I left for school, would always ask me, girls are what? And I had to yell, strong, smart, and bold. This adage only resonated with greater vigor, as here I am today, where I still am an advocate for young girls, especially those striving for perfection, constantly trying to fit into these societal ideals. So I've tried to marry this passion with another of my passions, fashion design, because I believe that we could revolutionize this old industry, often thought of as very shallow, into empowering women instead of tearing them down. This is my family today with my brothers and sisters, as well as my dad, because I can't forget his influence as well. So ultimately, the final perseverance of art and also how it's perceived is always by its audience, how they look at it, how their perspective hopefully shifts afterward as well as how they judge the talent of the artist. And this was the cause of my sweaty palms and lack of self-confidence in my work when I was 14. Because I had been designing since I was four years old, sketching these big dresses of rose bushes and mermaid scales and emeralds, and I've now settled for tool and trim. But the fact was, it was always a part of my internal identity, but I never shared it with others, because I thought if I wasn't successful enough, I wouldn't be able to really continue it. So whenever my mom would ask me if I could show her my sketchbook or show my friends all my work, I would say, didn't know what she was talking about, did not want to show it, because I was always afraid of the possible rejection, even though my parents were always very supportive. So eventually, this was my project for an eighth grade celebration piece, where we had to show how we'd grown over the middle school years and how we'd come into our own. So they finally persuaded me to put together this and put it forth in front of the entire middle school to finally show my friends what I really wanted to do for the rest of my life. And I started bawling when I walked into the auditorium and it was first in front of 120 entries. Because I realized I really had to cross this critical threshold in order to succeed whatsoever and gain confidence in myself as a person as well as as a designer. So these are a few photos from the fashion shows I've done. I've done about seven fashion shows today. And at this point, I've raised about $80,000 for two different charities because two of the shows I've put together, as well as been named Designer of the Year in 2011 for a citywide youth fashion show and featured in several art exhibits. So I'll just flip through these pictures as I kind of tell you all about the two charities it was raised for. One of them was called Speak Against Silence, and it was raising $50,000 for AIDS to Victims of Domestic Abuse. And all that money really went to going into the publication of books books for kids, 
because then these kids need to read these books to kind of be able to adjust after being taken out of an abusive home or being abused themselves, how to deal with it mentally and emotionally as well as physically. The next charity was House of Tiny Treasures. So they're a small homeless uh, children's pre-kindergarten under search. And we've raised $30,000 for them to date so they can expand their school, which it's a charity that's really grown close to my heart as I've gotten to know the kids over the past year because I've been creating an art curriculum for them. These are my kids. This was for another fashion show I did this year. And that comes to my collection now. Because this collection, I've realized with design, it's illuminated this new path, how it can tackle social and political issues through subtle social commentary, showing this whole new way that design and art can combine to mean something more. Because I want my clothes to mean something more than just fabric and just something to wear. So this dress specifically, I kind of started playing with identity. So this with the shards of glass and kind of rough edges and beaded phrases on other things was the fact that when we look at others, sometimes we see reflection of ourselves. A different identity, but still a reflection of ourselves. May that be a good or a bad thing. And we often see this in our parents, especially. And so then we start to question the different ideas and ideals in American culture, whether these different senses of identities, do we agree with them or not? And that now goes into culture. More specifically, we're all placed in different societies, different communities different areas where we're then placed into societal molds, where we then have to fill these molds, fill our responsibilities, do what we're told. And we then are questioned, did we break these molds and did we break them well? Did we break them for the better? Girls especially really deal with all this striving for perfection, striving to fill these molds. When they don't fill these molds perfectly, you can then suffer from low self-esteem. And often low self-esteem, to a dangerous extent, can really fuel bulimia, cutting, depression, and anorexia. So I must put a trigger warning on the next couple images because they're a bit gruesome. So two out of three girls in the US today suffer from eating disorder behaviors. That may be they've never been diagnosed, maybe they've been cured, maybe they've been treated, but they suffer from eating disorder behaviors. Depression rates prepubescence are the same among boys and girls and then double in girls postpubescence. And then six to nine-year-old girls 42% of them think they are fat, and 82% of 10-year-old girls wish they were thinner. So this image in particular, this is a girl at a rehabilitation center for anorexia. She drew herself on the board of what she thought she looked like, and then her therapist drew on the board what she actually looked like. So as you can see, this can happen at all stages of life in different ages and for different time periods. That's what makes this so huge. So why does this sound like a call to action piece? Why is this here? Why is this now? Is because from 1997 to 2007, the amount of cosmetic surgeries for solely aesthetic purposes on, 18, on girls 18 or younger has more than tripled. So here are a few ways that I think we can revolutionize the industry into tearing, instead of tearing girls down, to empower them. So here are a few images. And the fact is, two huge ways that you can make an impact was there's one way, which is the Nicholas Kristof way in Half the Sky, which is to employ women from another country where maybe men are more the patriarchal sense, and that they need the economic and social independence, so they start making fabrics for other companies abroad, and then they can gain social and economic independence in their own towns. And then there's also the way, to quote my seven-year-old self, that all girls need to see that they are beautiful and have different bodies and different diverse races on the runway. Because the fact is, especially growing up, I've realized the richness and diversity and the necessity of it, especially when normally you have a stream of over five, nine feet tall girls under 110 pounds and all Caucasian. Because one of my favorite quotations is by Alice Walker is that you can't see what you, you can't be what you cannot see. Because often our ideas of what is beautiful is molded into what we have seen as beautiful. And then to really revolutionize and make a new idea of beautiful and recreate the definition, we must break it down and show new ways of what beauty really is. So here are different ways that it has been done. And often, they've actually been really successful because they're seen as a new perspective, a new fresh way to look at diversity as well as fashion. So that brings me to loving yourself. To simply, the fact is often with girls, the little minor things are seen as imperfections, such as scars or burns, 
the freckles. We see these little things that value our work, that make us who we are. We think these define us and that they undercut our worth and undercut who we are. But that's ludicrous to think that these little things then define us because that just means we've fallen down, and we've gotten right back up, and we've kept living. So we shouldn't think that these things must then define our bodies and define our currency because our bodies are ours and for no one else to comment on. And they're ours ourselves to own, love, and respect. This is my final for beautiful women, all different shapes, colors, and sizes, and ages. Thank you very much. <laughs>